Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Everything Co-op is the program. And we talk about the values of cooperative business models, particularly compared to the capitalistic business model. And it's been stated that Americans are in love with capitalism. And that may be true, but I fell in love with co-ops when I found about them about 25 years ago. And this morning we have Marla Balonic. Balonic. It's close, okay. yeah. <laughs> and Karina Mendoza in the studio with us this morning. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. How Thanks are you guys so doing today? Thanks for having us. We're doing great. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you for coming in this morning. Thank you for all of the work that you do. And that's what we want to find out. What do you do? What is the Lat- Latino Economic Development Center? So I'll start, and Karina can jump in um, with anything she might want to add. LEDC, that's sort of our acronym that we go by, and and most people recognize us by that name. We have been around for 27 years. We were founded in Mount Pleasant in Washington, D.C., but um, now have actually um, five offices in the region. So we're headquartered in D.C. with two offices in Maryland, one um, just down the street in Wheaton, Maryland, one in Baltimore, Maryland, one in Arlington, Virginia, and one in Herndon, Virginia. Um, And then, as I said, our headquarters in D.C. And we are working to help Latinos and other underserved communities to build assets as a way. I'm sorry. What's asset? Build assets. Yes. Build assets. So ownership to improve their financial position and that of their families. And so really the two areas of focus that we have are housing and home ownership and small business ownership. So the division of labor here today is going to be myself talking about the work that we do on the housing side, particularly with co-ops in Washington, D.C., and Karina is going to be talking about the small business side. Okay. So Marla, you're housing and Karina is small business. Correct. Yes. Well, I'll I'll say that with a disclaimer that I'm the executive director, so I'm actually not on the front lines, and I'm very envious and admiring of my staff that are out sort of in the trenches doing the day-to-day work, but I... I'm speaking about our housing work today. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you got to know about all of it. Yes. Executive director. Yes. Well, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Marla. Okay. <Yes. laughs> okay. So housing and small business, but you want to build assets. Yes. You so want folks to build assets. Yes. So our idea is that the racial and what ethnic race divide um, in terms of wealth. Um, is partially due to the inability for our communities to build assets. And so this sort of bleeds into generational um, poverty because, you know, there are other groups that have been building assets for a long time, can pass down homes, can pass down businesses. Are right, you talking about white people? Well, sure, yeah. All right, <laughs> so, all right, let's talk about it. Let's get okay. straight here. Okay. So white folks so, in America. Yes. So this In is, Europe. They've yes. been getting assets and holding on to them and passing them down from generation exactly, to generation. Exactly, which gives a leg up to the next generation. And so we're looking well, to break I, that cycle. No, no y- y'all don't have it, okay? We black people and Latino, we don't have it because we don't want to work and we're lazy. No. Boss. No. <laughs> no, well, come on. Let's no. just be straight here. We're lazy. We don't go to school. No, it, there are systemic reasons. And, and part of it um, is information, and that's really – a part of what we do is connect our clients to information around how to go about building assets. Um, but we also have other products. Um, I would be remiss to not mention that we're a community development financial institution. So we also provide loans for individuals who are looking to start or grow businesses. And we also have some consumer products to help people build credit. So you're a CDFI. We are a CDFI. Oh, fantastic. So and I love that money. you use that acronym because there are many people who sort of scratch their head when you throw out CDFI. So 
I mean, I would expect nothing less from you, but it's uh, awesome either way. Yes. Okay. And then uh, my role as a small business technical assistance uh, provider is uh, helping and, and working one-on-one with these uh, clients that walk into our office and helping them develop their business plan, uh, helping them with the licensure and permit uh, uh, permits uh, either in D.C., in Maryland, in Baltimore, and making sure – to empower them and 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 really prepare them to be able to apply to these uh, small business loans and therefore build and develop their businesses so that way they are able then to create jobs to the community and in fact a lot many of our clients are actually job creators for their communities and their families you know i'm 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 glad you brought up the information uh, learning training mm-hmm. And I know you know, and I just everybody out there, I was joking because too often white folks believe that blacks and Hispanics are poor for our own fault. It's our fault that we don't have assets. It's our fault. And they don't look at um, discrimination, slavery, Mm -hmm. all of the different things that come out of that from not having information or starting off in debt. Mm-hmm. When my father passed, he had he he left me two thousand dollars of mm. debt. Mm. <laughs> okay, a debt, right? <laughs> not right, not an asset. And when I had friends, mostly white, but some black, who when their parents give them the down payment for their home mm-hmm. or buy them their car, that's such a great step up. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a trust fund, but some of them have trust funds. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. when you end up with that, you you talk about a leg up. It's two legs, five legs, ten Absolutely. legs up. And compared to that single mom, whether it's Latino or African American or Asian American or anybody, even whites, there's more poor white folk than mm-hmm. than black. But mm-hmm. people don't want to get that mm-hmm. uh, too often. The media right. doesn't want to get it. So I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. So on our mountaintop, we were all poor. Right. Okay, and it was it was white and black. We didn't have Hispanics. Mm-hmm. We didn't have Asians. We didn't have Native Americans, mm-hmm. except for those of us that have Native Americans as part of our mix. Mm-hmm. And we were all poor. And and it it was not because of folks lazy. Our my both of our parents worked, and most of the people up there work is mm-hmm. working poor. Mm-hmm. And don't have and don't know how to manage money. So I'm glad this we get this training in. That's mm-hmm. that, okay. All right. <laughs> Great. We'll preach here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So which one you want to talk about housing or small business first? And in particular with co-ops, what are you mm-hmm. doing? Um, well, I can hop in on housing. Um, so Washington, D.C. has a very strong model law, which is the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, which everyone refers Topa. to as TOPA. Um, and this law went into place in the 70s. It's a 38-year-old um, law that has been... Um, really a way to preserve affordable housing in the district. So um, I jotted down before we met that our um, D- in D.C. the median price of a home is $559,000. Now that's the median. So, of course, there are um, outliers in price on, on either end of the spectrum. But, you know, that's a really inaccessible price point for most people um, who are coming at the home purchase process. And so, um, you know, And also I'll note that in D.C., of course, and I'm not stating anything other than the obvious, but um, housing stock, period, is very limited. And then narrow that down even further to affordable housing. So the role that LADC takes with regard to TOPA is first um, around this education piece that you mentioned. So we're informing people of their rights, ideally before their building is even close to going up for sale. So we want all of the residents in D.C., um, you know, and we share this burden or privilege with other organizations um, that are doing similar work. But we want all residents that are renters in D.C. to know that if their building goes for sale, they have the right of first refusal. Um, and we want them to know that way ahead of time, because what happens is when a building goes up for sale, there are a lot of interests at play and people who come in. Um, and this is an opportunity for um, sharks, for lack of a better way of putting it, coming in and offering what can seem like a tantalizing payout, which in the short term would be very attractive. However, um, you know, this is a real opportunity. And again, this is very rare. This this type of program does not exist in other metropolitan areas in the United States. Um, 
if tenants can form an association, they can go ahead and purchase the building themselves. Um, and this not only um, builds an asset for them and their families, but it maintains affordable housing because typically when a private developer comes in and purchases a building that is um, affordable rental units, they are going to transform it into something that is you know, not necessarily affordable, um, typically for smaller um, dwellings. So, you know, we're talking about the studios or the one one bedroom apartments that are not really built for families. And so, um, you know, the role that we take is first informing people of their rights. Second, if and when their building goes up for sale, um, you know, jumping in and, and informing people of sort of what their options are, helping them troubleshoot that process. And then we um, actually help folks form an association, um, you know, respond to um, the offer of sale letter and um, get in there and, and buy that building. So um, we typically work with about 70 buildings a year. Seven zero. Yep. Wonderful. Okay, now listen, let's go all the way back. Yeah, here. I know I sort of rambled Topa. on and on. Yes. Topa <laughs> is the law Marion Barry helped to put in ages ago. Okay, and that helps the tenant to buy their units. They're, a, they're, they're building, building collectively collective. as a co-op, as a, which is why we're here today. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the first thing a, a tenant should do when they hear that their building is up? What do you recommend the first thing they should do? They should gather with their fellow tenants. Um, and this is really a challenging part, and this is where our role comes in. Because if you think about a building in D.C., um, you can have multi-languages, you know, People who are working very hard not may not necessarily already have a built-in relationship, and now we're asking them to come together and make a pretty major financial investment and commitment together. And so um, the idea is for them to get together, form an association, develop the leadership structure of that association. So, you know, typically a, um, just like any other board, there are officers, so there'll be a president, um, a treasurer, you know, um, and so our role is to facilitate that process. See, Marla, I'm way back. I, I'm right. way back to the. Oh. All right, I hear I'm a tenant, yes. and I hear my buildings go up. It's a 50 unit building, yeah, uh, in Mount Pleasant or okay. in Southeast DC. Right. Sure. It's 50 units, and they want fifty thousand dollars a unit, whatever, at two point five right. million dollars. Right. Okay, and that's a huge number. Yes. So. The first thing I should do is try to organize the tenants. Well, what would I do? So my my thought <laughs> my thought is that yes, you do want to get together with your fellow yeah, but tenants. But my thought is yeah. they call you. Oh yeah, call us. Okay, sure, I mean, absolutely. I, mean, yes, me, I, did, I could not understand what you were getting at. Okay. Yes, call because us. Please organizing call us. the tenants is difficult, yes. and they need help in yes. doing that. Agreed. Agreed. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. But we. Ideally, we'll have already gotten to your building, flyered your building. So, yes, you would have our contact information and know where to turn. Okay, so you will get the information. Is that for sale? And then Yes. So the Department of Housing and Community Development actually publishes a list that we have access to of all the buildings that are going up for sale. And we, um, you know, go to those buildings and flyer there so that folks are aware of what's happening. Okay. So Department of Housing and Community Development, yes. DHCD, yep. sends you out a list of all houses that have been sold, and then you will... All that are up for sale, yes. Up for sale. Yeah. And, and then, then we'll reach out to the tenants. We'll physically go to the buildings. We knock on doors. If people don't respond, we'll slip a flyer under their door. You know, so you're to, proactive. We're very proactive. Because they only have 45 days to, yes. to form a tenant association. Yes. That's the first thing that they have to do. Right. They have 45 days to respond to the offer of sale. Okay. How long do they have to form the tenant association? Well, between the offer of sale letter and, and those 45 days. So the sooner the better. Okay. Listen, we've got to take our first break. If anybody out there would like to call, you can call 1-800-450-7876 with a question or comment. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we're talking cooperatively here today with Marla and Karina, talking from the Latino Economic Development Center, LEDC, talking about housing forming cooperatives and tenants getting ownership. And we're talking about small businesses. The whole intent is to get people to create assets, 
assets are those things that you own, own, if you own it. And then you can grow it and grow it and grow it. And if you, too often, people in underserved communities, marginalized communities, they don't have assets, they have liabilities. And that's what you owe. And too often we owe more than we own. And Latino Economic Development Center is trying to change that formula around where you own more than you owe. Did I say it right? Exactly. You said it perfectly. Okay. All right, so we're talking about housing right now and the steps that you go through. And this is, TOPA is an awesome, awesome, awesome tool to create wealth, Mm -hmm. okay, to create the asset. So if you find your building is being sold, the first thing you want to do is call Latino Economic Development Center. What number would they call? So our main line is 202-588-5102. Again, that's 202-588-5102. And you can also check out our website, which is www.ledcmetro, and that's all one word, dot O-R-G. Again, that's www.ledcmetro, dot O-R-G. So you can call them to get help. They can help you formalize, get the information you need, so you can start your tenant association and start the process of buying and owning that building. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to just note is that um, part of our role as facilitators is we bring other resources to the table. So we also bring pro bono legal representation um, through partners that we work with. Um, some are, you know, hugely uh, successful and well-known law firms in the city um, that are offering their their support. Um, we also bring in um, project financing through partners um, as well. And so um, that is part of the process that we'll bring people through is not just solely. Um, I just want to make it clear that it's not solely that you form the association and then you have to sort of find a way to come up with legal representation and financing. That's part of what we are bringing to bear through our partnerships. What about developers? Um, um, renovators, the people that will come in and if they need to, fix a roof or something that so that piece is not part of our service offering Mm -hmm. but um that's actually something that we're working on um actually connecting our small business side too because we do have a lot of contractors that work in that space so Mm -hmm. um we would love to connect the dots between our programs in that way um but what about you don't work with mana or mikasa or we do yes yes so mikasa Mm -hmm. is a major partner of ours actually their executive director is on our board fernando Fernando Lemos. Lemos. yeah um and so yes we are also working with developers um the other thing i wanted to mention too is that we also view it as success um you know the ultimate success is for a building to be purchased by the tenants but we also um have utilized this process to just give um tenants a greater voice And so um, even if they do decide that they want an external party to purchase their building, we've used this process to form the association so that the association has a voice to say, you know, make demands around uh, maintaining rent levels, around um, making repairs to the building, you know, conditions issues. So, um, you know, that's sort of another part of it is that, um, you know, this collective um, effort is not for naught, even if they decide and they may decide that they are not going to go ahead and purchase their building. Well, what I do for a living is I manage a building. Right. And I found out about co-ops by managing housing co-ops. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've fallen in love with the model because it does help people to create wealth. Absolutely. And not only wealth from a standpoint of dollars and cents, but wealth in terms of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Because the fifth principle of cooperatives is training, education, and information. Mm-hmm. And getting people trained up on how to work together and how to make informed decisions is awesome. Absolutely. And I've watched people... Um, increase their own self-worth. Absolutely. Okay. And that's what's phenomenal. Yeah. I think there's also an immeasurable element of like what gets passed down from generations, not just Uh, the physical asset, but the, the, the knowledge, as you said, and also, um, just sort of this, um, I don't want to say habit. I don't know if that's the right way to say, but, um, it's like the developing of a practice that then also gets passed down to, from one generation to another. So a practice of homeownership or small business ownership 
um, I think there's something to that being passed down along with the asset itself. Yeah, it's bigger, and I'm glad you brought it up. I have not even been thinking, but I've been thinking about the individual, that mm-hmm. what they get or that family, but not generational. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. So, so let me ask you now, uh, Marla and Karina, do you like what you do? Yes. Yes. Karina, oh, <laughs> yes. you're brightening up over there. <laughs> yes, I, I, there's not a day where I don't wake up saying, sweet baby Jesus, thank you for my job. <laughs> uh, wow. I am a transplant from Los Angeles, California, and every day, and so my own perspective of what Latino means and what a member of a minority community means, and a daughter of immigrants, I am able to assist everyday people of color walking in, wanting to start a business. And it's starting a business not because it's their passion, not necessarily because it's their passion or they want to uh, be the next Martha Stewart or whatever, but it's, it's because they need this business to get economically up the structure ladder. Mm -hmm. So they need, it's entrepreneurship out of necessity to live and to survive. And in the process, they, they teach their family. They are, they provide and create great role models for their family members and also for the community. Because what ends up happening is that for every entrepreneur that starts a business within six months, they end up hiring, they end up creating one to four jobs. And that's the kind of job creation that we don't hear, and especially in this era of anti-immigration, what we're finding and what we're really doing is basically showing the the actual narrative, which is immig- immigrants as job creators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I started my property management business in 1993, and I, somewhere around 2000, a good friend of mine told me the best gift you can give somebody is a job. Yeah. And I had never mm-hmm. thought about it that way. Yeah. It, it, the and that's best a, is it creating, you say, three to four jobs? One to four jobs. Yes. And within months of starting their business. And time and time again, the, I'm finding that our clients are just hungry for information and for knowledge on how to do everything legally and write so that way they could just move on and really develop their business time and time again i'm constantly building a partnership with the department of health with dcra with osse which is the office of state uh, superintendent education in dc for child care uh, uh, providers and time again these Organiza- government organization are just blown away that our classrooms are filled to the limit with participants, with clients, because clients will drop everything to come to our workshops to get accurate information in their language. In their language? Mm-hmm. Yes. All, every, all the services that we offer are bilingual. And so it's either English or Spanish, and we also have limited funding to be able to bring translators, and we, the housing department does have the uh, software, the headsets for translators. Yes. We typically, in our um, tenant meetings, um, and sometimes our small business trainings, have um, multilingual translation going on, so we'll have someone representing um, or speaking Amharic, I should say, or and folks speaking in Spanish, or the training will be delivered in Spanish with English headsets for folks who don't speak Spanish. And what's the other language you said? Amharic, which is um, primarily uh, Ethiopian language. Okay. Yeah, I knew what it was. I just wanted to make sure everybody out there. <laughs> okay. Amharic, you don't hear it often, like right. Spanish or French or German or yeah. those other languages. And there's a lot of Ethiopians here. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, yes. I managed one building. It must have had eight different languages, and most of them were African yeah. languages. Wow. Yes. And first generation. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal what you get in D.C. in terms of the 
beautiful cultures. Yes, yes. agreed. Yeah. And we're working hard on preserving them and making sure that these longstanding community members and entrepreneurs stay in D.C. and thrive when D.C. is thriving. At $559,000 per house, the median mm -hmm. house sale, that nice. gets yeah. to be really mm -hmm. tough in D.C. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, Tenant comes to you. and go back mm -hmm. to this one again, and we'll come back. All right, we only have one minute, but we'll come <laughs> we'll, after the break. <laughs> we'll come back, and, and I want to talk about the, the other steps after you form the Tenant Association. Mm -hmm. What are the steps that you do? Mm -hmm. And I've been through this process several times as my owning or managing something. And so it can be a very tedious process, mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. have got to go through it and follow it. Great way of creating wealth. And we'll come back and talk. I want to get some examples of some of the businesses you've helped to start. Okay? We'll be okay. right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. Talk about the benefits of co-ops, and the National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program so that you can get the information to either help start a business or to look for a co-op, either housing co-op, credit union. Uh, you look for REI is moved into town. It's a co-op. So you look for a co-op, and you can buy their products or, or uh, help support them. The mission of NCB is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And they've been doing that since the 80s, and they do a great job of it. So today we're talking with Marla and Karina from the Latino Economic Development Center, and they work with and help everybody or anybody in marginal communities to create wealth. That's money, right. money, money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we said we're going to come back and talk about this process of TOPA process. We talked earlier that you form a tenant association mm -hmm. as tenants come together and form this association. And then what's the steps after that? So after 45 days, the association must respond um, with a, an uh, offer. Um, and then there's a next period of 120 days for negotiation with the landlord. With the owner? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Apologies. Um, and so that um, process, you know, is really similar to any home sale uh, for folks listening who have, um, you know, gone in with an offer and then you go back and forth with the, the seller on, um, you know, many different elements of the sale. It could be price. It could be, you know, other elements that you're trying to loop into the contract. So it could be, you know, fixing something or, or what have you. Um, and so we also facilitate that process. Okay. Yeah. So you get the tenant association, they go negotiate in 45 days, mm -hmm. they create the tenant association in 120 days. They have to, Create a to negotiate to negotiate, yeah. and yeah. then what do they have to? Do? How long before they have to purchase it? Um, you know, I'm not sure of the exact timing between then and when they have to purchase it, but typically, assuming that their negotiation, you know, comes mm -hmm. to closure with our, all parties agreeing, um, then the sale is made. My recollection is mm -hmm. six months. Okay, and what can happen as long as the tenants are making progress? Mm -hmm they can go back and ask for another six months. Right. And so they have an basically up into period. a year, yeah. extended period. But I've also found out that if tenants are really doing what they are expected to do, they can even ask for extensions beyond mm -hmm. that. Yeah, and so, I will definitely say that these engagements are not like an overnight experience no. for anyone involved. So, you know, the successes that we have every year are not, typically buildings that we started working with that year. It's typically buildings that we've been working with over an extended period of time. So you get the seller, if they really want to sell, they get frustrated that it takes so long. Yes. And sometimes the residents, the tenants get frustrated because it takes so long. Yes. But it, ta it takes a long period of time. And I tell tenants, look, 
it takes a long time, but you end up with an asset. Absolutely. Yeah. You end up with value. Yeah. Although you bring something up. Um, so this uh, bill or law, I should say, has been in effect for, you know, almost 40 years. But um, and it's a miracle, truly, that it has stayed on for so long, given the other interests at play mm -hmm. um, in a quickly developing city like D.C., um, but this year is the first year that there's actually been a rollback to TOPA, and that is as it applies to single-family homes. So single-family homes are now not going to be subject to TOPA. Okay. Yeah. So that that's a little bit worrisome just in the sense that, well, first of all, for many, um, you know, residents, their, their renting of a single-family home is how they maintain affordable housing for themselves and their family. And then secondly, um, I think it proposes a symbolic um, you know, shift um, mm -hmm. that we're definitely keeping our eye on. See, I've never even dealt with the single family home. I've mm -hmm. only dealt with the multifamily home yeah. side, so I've not even done that. Yeah, um, yeah and we, um, our tenant organizers are very active in terms of advocating. They spend a lot of time at the Wilson Building. Um, that's, you know, sort of part of their role just is preserving this um, incredible asset that, you know, speaking of assets, um, this is an intangible asset that the city brings to bear that we really want to protect. Well, 559, 559,000, is that the number you mm -hmm. said? Yeah, the average home. And that keeps going up. Yep. There's no sense that that's going to be going no, down or slow anything down like in that. Sight. Quick, yeah. quick story, Mount Pleasant. Uh, when I first got here in 1986, I tried to buy a 55-unit property right in the center of Mount Pleasant with mostly Latino tenants. Mm -hmm. And I I don't remember the price, but it was so, it was like $500,000 or something. For the building. For the building. Wow. Yeah, it was something, and it was on for, it was foreclosure deal. Mm -hmm. The bank had taken it back, and they told me, if I could come up with ten, if either ten or twenty percent, then they would finance the balance, and I couldn't come up with that. It got away, right? And it's right. sort of I saw that for sale. I don't know five years ago for it was two million, three oh, million, yeah. four million. It was painful, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a big one that got away, right? <laughs> big fish that got away, but but that's the the sense of the values that have gone up like so much oh, yes, exactly. in a short period of time, and they're going to keep going up. Uh, it's yes. the way it looks. Yep. Yeah, there's no end in sight from what I can see. So we really have to get some houses, keep some houses affordable. So why do you make them co-ops? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I've never really thought about that. I mean, I think it's certainly more accessible from a price point of view, um, you know, to have multiple folks in, in, along with financiers coming together to, to make the deal happen. But um you know, that is the structure of, of how TOPA is, is put together. Um, and I think from a mission standpoint, it's definitely aligned with what we believe in in terms of, um, you know, community members supporting one another and um, sort of being part of a collective effort rather than being, you know, sort of a standalone. Exactly. And I think the uh, larger question is why not? go co-op. And I think uh, time and time again, I, I think living in our current capitalist uh, economy, we're always taught to think about the individual, trust, uh, trust nobody, help yourself before you help somebody else. However, time and time again, uh, traditions from our cultures and also uh, how, I hate to say this, how poor people survive is work is community, or either our family as supporters or our neighbors as supporters, helping out with daycare, helping out bartering, helping giving somebody a lunch for them, fixing your car or uh, fixing your roof, uh, help hiring the next uh, door neighbor's son to help with the lawn and stuff like that. And what we're finding is that the chain, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. So if we can strengthen each other up, we will support each other. And so it's it, we're definitely stronger together. And I think with the co-ops, with the topas and housing, if your neighbors stand together, then you got then everybody can work to maintain affordable housing, uh, to maintain affordable housing not only in your building, but ideally in your block and in your neighborhood. And in fact, uh, one of our uh, 
our chair board member, uh, Sylvia Salazar, was uh, uh, one of the uh, or tenant organizers in 2011 to uh, help organize her building in Norwood neighborhood. And she's now one of our uh, leaders or, or advisors in mm -hmm. the child care uh, co-op that she's assisting 11 uh, Latinas and Latinos form a uh, small business for uh, bilingual uh, child care uh, provide a center. So I think you got it. That, that's the answer that I would give to that question of why co-ops mm -hmm. is this whole center of community, the whole okay. center of community. And, and the, the ethical values of co-ops are honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for one another. Mm -hmm. And that caring for one another is sort of at the center of co-ops. And the hill that I grew up in in Bluefield, West Virginia, everybody helped everybody, and we were an extended family. And that's what I'm hearing you saying. Mm -hmm. and, and when you go to community and poor people, uh, I guess, and also I don't even like that term because we didn't know we were, we were poor. poor. Mm -hmm. There was no sense of poor. It was a sense right. that we all worked together. We didn't have as much as maybe the next neighborhood, but we clearly were rich in family, rich exactly. in culture, mm -hmm. rich mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for that. In, in traditions. In traditions. Yeah. Um, so, so, so communities bring a, a, a lot. Yes. Okay. There is a term called Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. -U -U. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten that to, for me, it means what the center of cooperative is. Uh, Ubuntu is a Southern African con uh, term or way of being. And it it is I am because you are. Mm. And you are because okay. I am as opposed to I am, I think that I am or this stuff that other cultures believe in. But for most of us, it is I am because you are and you are. This is a community. And so we look out for each other. And Mandela did not hurt his jailers mm -hmm. because he knew if he hurt them, he was hurting himself. Mm -hmm. And And so... This to me is the center of what cooperative is, mm -hmm. and, and and it goes the the values and the principles of co-ops go back to 1844 in um, a city right outside of the UK. But I I think it goes way. As a matter of fact, I was in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and a conference, and a guy said he went to Peru in 18 I mean in the 1400s. So I think it goes all the way back. As a matter of fact, I think that's the center of humanity mm -hmm. is working together, mm -hmm. caring for each yes. other. It's a very uh, natural and, construct. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of also want to say that it's also part of American history with Eleanor and Dor uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and especially with them making sure that workers have decent housing and access to nature and access to a quality life, even if they are lower, quote-unquote, lower income. Everybody has access to that, and even the city of like Greenbelt was started based on that those values. And so, I really love to think of co-ops as being part of not only American history but part of like Maryland and D.C. history because it does have that trace. Greenbelt had seven co-ops in it, uh, sixteen hundred unit housing co-op, and they have an incubator. And they're created. They they had seven, four years ago. They were in the program the first month, four and a half years ago. Had some people from Greenbelt. Yeah. Um, so, they may have more than seven now. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about give us some examples of businesses that you have to start. Are are they co-ops? Uh, right now, I'm uh, working with one co-op workers co-op. And uh, some of the other uh, businesses that I helped uh, start uh, or provided assistance uh, have been either family businesses or individual businesses. But I think that the Cofamilia Bilingual Child Care Cooperative has been the most eye-opening uh, experience for me just because I'm the most cynical person. <laughs> it is by oh, no, you're cynical. <laughs> what, what's the name of it? Co it's called the Cofamilia Bilingual Child Care Co-op. Cofamilia. Yes. Bilingual family. A child care co-op, 
And the heart of it is in Logan Square, D.C. And what's Cofamilia? Uh, that is the name. Uh, basically, uh, just Cofamilia, meaning we're all the family. But it's the community we were just community. talking about. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. We're, we're all in the family. Yes, mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. all uh, women with who... Uh, Latinas who live in the area uh, surrounding uh, the Luster Place uh, Memorial Church. And uh, I think they have been longstanding re- D.C. residents. Okay, we re- we have to take our next break, and this is our final... Ooh. Yeah, this is our final break. This is going back too quick. I need another <laughs> hour or two, ladies. We're going to take our final break, and then we'll be right back. If you have any questions, you can call in at one 800 Four five zero seven eight seven six. We'll be right back. Washington D.C.'s News Talk, fourteen fifty AM WOL and ninety five point nine FM. Information is power, and this is why the National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program to give you information about co-ops, and this is why WOL is a great partner. But you know, information is stored power. It only becomes powerful when you use it. You got to sort of like a, a gallon of gasoline. You don't. You have the stored power, but you've got to strike it with something in order to get the power out of it. So we're hoping that you will go to the Latino Economic Development Center's webpage, ledcmetro.org. Ledcmetro.org. Or you can call them at 202-588-5102 if you want to start a business or if you want to buy your building. They could get, get you help. They also have a LEDC, um, a CDFI, so they can loan you money. And I went to their webpage, and they said you can get up to $50,000. That is correct. I say wonderful, $50,000. Okay. Can I get 50,000 times 10? (laughs) Okay, so there's four different types of co-ops, and we were talking about a couple of them earlier. If if the employees own the business, own and control the business, then it's called a worker cooperative. And the child care center is look like it's going to be a worker-owned cooperative. The people that work there are going to own it. Correct. If it's owned by the people that uses the products or services, it's called a consumer. The consumers are the one that owns and controls it. It's a consumer cooperative. And we get that with credit unions. The housing co-ops are consumer-owned because the people that live there are using the products or services. There's a a health clinic in Madison, Wisconsin, that's owned by the patients. It's a consumer-owned cooperative. It's patient-centric. And then the other two types are if you come together to purchase things, it's a purchasing co-op. And the reason that they really work is because the people that work there get the skill sets and working with vendors and creating contracts. And so the members get a better price, a better product normally at a lower price. And right here in, in the, so farmers are the ones that use that a lot. Artists are beginning to use that cooperative. But there's one in the district, uh, Community Purchasing Alliance. And if you ladies don't know about that one, you may want to look them up. It is a, they come together for mainly churches, nonprofits, charter schools. Uh, I'm, some of the co-ops I manage are beginning to, to buy products from them. Uh, trash collection, the nice. churches were paying two, three times more than what they ought mm-hmm. to have. Um, uh, utilities, solar panels. Uh, I bought my copier through them, and I was so glad that the contract was already, they had changed. Every time I was going through it, I said, no, I don't want this. And then they said, oh, well, you with CPA, so we have a different contract, so give me theirs. Right. And they had already negotiated everything that I would wow. have had to negotiate. That's great. So that's on the purchasing side. And then on the marketing side, uh, for selling of the products and services, you have marketing co-ops that people come together again uh, to uh, get more markets and normally a better price for their goods. Farmers, a lot, have done it. And you see that the Cabot 
Creamery, uh, Ocean Spray, uh, Lando Lakes are different uh, marketing co-ops. Ace Hardware is probably both uh, a purchasing mm-hmm. and a marketing co-op. Uh, I know they're purchasing. So you, you get different ways of coming together. It's all about coming together, creating community to benefit the community. In a lot of civil rights and women's rights and Latino rights, folks that have been marginalized have used co-ops to to get power Correct. and, yep. and accomplish things. Mm-hmm. All through the civil rights movement, if I have it, if it wasn't for co-ops, the civil rights movement either would not have happened or not happened as well as it did or as successful as it did. But everybody you can think of in the civil rights movement were involved with co-ops in some kind of way. And going back to Frederick Douglass in the 1850s. So that's the four different types of co-ops. So you you started telling us about the Latinas. Oh, yes, the Cofamilia Bilingual Child Care Co-op. And uh, these uh, longstanding, uh, about 11 uh, longstanding uh, D.C. resident, minority residents in D.C. who for the past basically all their lives in D.C. have been working multiple jobs uh, just to make uh, ends meet, and they decided that enough is enough, and they want to just form a group and start a a co-op. And particularly, they were coming across the social issues, uh, the the current big problem in D.C., which is the rising cost of living and also the horrendous rising cost of commercial leasing, where as a, a small business coach, I'm seeing that any businesses, business owners can have anywhere from $2,000 to $9,000 a month rent on their space. And so, and also, and particularly in D.C., we're having increasing regulations on on uh, child care providers, on how much education they need and certain certifications and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so the women kind of came together to put their strengths uh, in one pod and develop this uh, business model for everybody to be part of the business, share the responsibilities and the profit, while at the same time kind of turning their weaknesses into strengths as a, a group. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. And, you know, this is a great place. The sixth principle of co op is cooperation among cooperatives. Exactly. That if you can find a space in a housing co op, Mm-hmm. That may not be used. That could be used for the child care center. Exactly. It would be awesome. And we're having a lot of uh, neighborhood churches offering space for potential uh, daycare uh, space. And we also have a lot of different organizations in D.C. who have experience with cooperatives offering uh, advice and assistance in as the women laid the foundation of this uh, great endeavor. There's a book out you may want to read. It's called um, Communities Building Wealth. The the um, Democratic co- Collaborative is they're right out at University of Maryland. They built they um, you can get it online free. But there's a, a young Mexican American woman in there that they talk about her in New York. Uh, her salary went from seven dollars to twenty dollars an hour when she joined a cleaning cooperative Mm. so it's like any kind of co-op um and you get the increases because the profit that somebody else was getting off of you you're getting Mm -hmm. and then also lo and behold when uh, when workers own the business they figure out how they can do it better the efficiencies go up so with the efficiencies up and the sharing of profits, she got a threefold increase in income. Exactly. And also uh, these residents have over thir- collectively have over 35 years of experience in child care. And so I think that is definitely a strength for them. And it's also just an amazing role model and tail raising movement that they're doing for their families and for their communities saying you too cannot work like three zillion jobs mm-hmm. but can actually be a member of own a business the reason i brought up christina what she decided to do was work less hours and spend time with her two kids yeah mm-hmm. yeah and make more money yeah right 
Yeah. Sounds like a sweet deal. Yeah. It's a win, 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 yeah, win, 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 win. Definitely. Yeah. The new so, disruptor. I know that's why y'all smile when you say, do you like your work? Because when you can help people do that. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So what's another one? That's the, the ladies working together. What's another business you help with? Gosh, where do I even start? <laughs> uh, I, I think currently right now I'm also working with longstanding businesses on Georgia Avenue and Columbia Road. Uh, both corridors have uh, – basically are going undergoing a lot of transition and the with the changing demographics these long standing businesses are struggling to kind of uh, maintain their business model. Mm -hmm. And so uh, two of them, uh, one of them is Johnny Flores on the corner of uh, Georgia Avenue in Florida. He is a Vietnam War vet and has been in business for at least 25 years. And when he first started, he hired all D.C. minority businesses all uh, D.C. Uh, minority residents who, unfortunately, over the past 10 years have been pushed out to the suburbs of Maryland and uh, Virginia. And so we've been able to not only provide uh, 20 hours of professional consultation through the LADC uh, pro-business uh, mm -hmm. program, but we were uh, – also able to offer technical assistance for him to apply to the D.C. Great Streets grant. And so that is an economic initiative within D.C. that uh, basically uh, provides a $50,000, up to a $50,000 grant for brick and mortars in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of the longstanding D uh, minority businesses, f for various reasons, uh, have a harder time accessing that grant and because of technology, because of. So I, I'm sorry to cut you, but we only have one minute left. And I just like to know what last words would you like to tell people out there besides call you? Mm. I would just say that um, cooperatives, I mean, this conversation has really brought to light for me that cooperatives really are just a natural extension of our communities. And so, um, you know, wherever an organization like LADC or otherwise can just sort of be the catalyst yes. or impulse to bring that together, um, it's sort of our natural state. And our we're stronger state. together. We are definitely stronger together. Stronger together, everybody. We'll see you next Thursday. And I would say in this week, please live and work cooperatively. We're stronger together. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W.O. and 95.9 FM.